Howdy class, how's it going? You probably don't know who I am. That's okay. I'm gonna teach you something today. We're gonna to learn a little bit about some science. My name is Taylor Haas. We're in strange times right now. You may be in a classroom, you may not be in a classroom. I'm at my house right now recording this video. This fancy background behind me, it's fake, it's not real. But what it shows is uh, it's the logo for the Michigan State University Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. And I'm a graduate student at Michigan State doing some research, um, a scientist in training, if you will. And you know, we thought with quarantine and everything getting real weird around the world right now that what could we do to help you out? Maybe we could have some fun. So there's a series of, of uh, recordings, grad students doing similar things. This one, let me welcome you, is for a second grade class. And we're gonna learn about changing landforms. So I've got a little presentation for you and I hope you like it. I worked hard on it. I think it's interesting. And I hope we can learn something together today. But before we do that, you may want to know who is this mysterious stranger that your teacher put on the screen to teach me? What do I know about anything? Well, I know a little bit, but that's going to be up to you at the end of the, the uh, presentation to decide how much. But a little background. I grew up in a place called Texas. You may hear a little accent here and there. I apologize. Um, then I went to school in Oklahoma for a couple years. And then I moved to Colorado. You can kind of see these stars. And then I moved up to Wyoming. Along the way, I did some things that I thought were pretty cool. For example, I got to ski around a smoky bear, teach kids about not starting forest fires or wildfires. I also got to play with a lot of animals out in Arizona where I lived. Big turtles, big snakes, even got to be a little fish doctor for a little bit. Got to do some surgeries on an endangered fish species. That's what's going on right here. Right now, what do I do? Well, in Michigan State, I work on these little creatures. You may have heard of them. They're called sea lamprey. These are them when they're little. They're pretty gnarly looking, pretty interesting. Kind of look like snakes or eels. They're neither. Um, they're their own little thing. And that's when they're little, this is what they look like when they get big. They'll suck onto you, they'll suck onto fish. They don't get too worried about swimming in the Great Lakes. You, you know, swimming around, don't have to worry about one of them getting stuck on you. I kind of did that for a funny for a funny picture. But what they will do is they'll eat onto fish. Um, they'll latch onto fish. So what I do is I study those little ones and we're trying to figure out how to keep the fish safe um, and the fish populations up and the lamprey away from the fish. So it's pretty interesting work. There's a lot of water. There's a lot of fish in the Great Lakes. I enjoy it. But back to changing landforms and the lesson. We're going to do a quick trivia question. Now back in Arizona, when I was there, if you go kind of northern Arizona, there's a very famous landmark there. Some of you may know what it is. Some of you may not. I bet a lot of you have probably heard about it. I don't know, maybe seen a picture of it. But this is what it looks like. Does anybody know what this big old ditch is called? I'll give you all a couple seconds to spit it out, blurt it out. Don't yell. Raise your hand maybe if you're in a classroom. It's called the Grand Canyon. And it is absolutely stunning. If you've ever seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I highly suggest if you're in second grade, you got a long life ahead of you at some point, go check it out because it is quite frankly incredible. Now, we're looking at the Grand Canyon and this picture doesn't do it justice, but it's a very deep canyon. How deep exactly? Well, scientists went out there with a big tape measure. I'm just kidding. They had some more sophisticated ways, fancier ways. And they discovered that it's about a mile from the top to the very bottom. So over this mile canyon, 
there's a river in the bottom of it, the Colorado River. And my question to you is, did the Grand Canyon always look so grand? Maybe was it ever just a great canyon or a good canyon? Perhaps it was no canyon at all. So what do you think? Did it always look like this? Answer, no, no, it didn't. So let's put on our thinking caps for a second. Let's consider of this Grand Canyon, since it didn't always look like this, how exactly do you think it got so grand? Now, I'll give you a second to think about it. Maybe look at this picture and see if there's any clues or hints that you may be able to find to think, hmm, maybe that's why, maybe that's how it got there. Now, where I'm from back in Texas, we have these things called tall tales. And since I didn't grow up here, I don't know if y'all heard the same tall tales, but back in Texas, we had a tall tale that a guy named Paul Bunyan, big old lumberjack, took this big old ax and he was walking away with his blue ox babe. He was dragging his ax along the ground and Paul Bunyan was so big, that ax was so big that he carved out the Grand Canyon. Who here thinks that that is how the Grand Canyon got here? Unfortunately, that is not how it happened. That would be a cool story. Um, but Canyon's a little too big even for Paul Bunyan. So the question is, how did it get there then? And there it is. This river down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon is responsible for how the Grand Canyon was formed. Now you think, okay, that's a big canyon and that didn't look like that much water, but there's a process we call erosion that over time can make some pretty spectacular things happen. And as the river is flowing, it's picking up sediment, which is dirt, fancy word for dirt. It's picking up rocks. It's picking up grass, trees, leaves. And as this water is continuously running across the river, the, the earth that it's flowing in, that sandpaper in the water, or all that stuff in the water, acts like sandpaper in what's called erodes and carves out and digs a ditch, which over time, when you get erosion and time, you can get some pretty magnificent looking features, such as the Grand Canyon. So another trivia question, how long did it take for the river to carve out the Grand Canyon? Take a second to guess, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, more, less, a couple seconds. Drum roll. Five million years. So is that a slow process or a fast process? It depends on who you ask, to be honest with you. Um, you know, the Earth's a lot older than five million years, but me, I may look old to you as a second grader, um, but five million years even to me is a pretty fast process, or excuse me, pretty slow process. So we're gonna side with the turtle here. Um, but there are fast erosion events. You know, that, that river cutting across dirt, they're cut, cutting across the canyon like that guy carving that wood. If you give it enough time, you can get a pretty impressive canyon. Um, but it's not always the case. And usually these fast erosion events, they're not as impressive looking as the Grand Canyon, but they're pretty impactful. So let's take a second, let's think, are there any 
erosion events you may think of, um, you know, anything you've seen where the landscape dramatically changes in maybe the blink of an eye. Pause that video, teacher. Let's think for a second. All right, welcome back. If you have something written down, good for you. If you can't think of any, that's okay too. That's what I'm here for. So here's some examples. Ever seen an avalanche on the, on the TV or anything like that? I know there's a lot of snow in Michigan. Usually avalanches occur when there's some mountains. But an avalanche, as the snow comes down the mountain, it's going to wipe out trees. It's going to wipe out boulders. It's going to wipe away rock faces. Snow, just like its liquid form, water, is also a very powerful, powerful entity. Another one, this is what's called a landslide or a mudslide. Kind of a poor quality video, but you can see what's going on here. This mud and land is coming from this mountain and coming down and it's wiping out these houses. This one, now that would be a rough place to live, right? This is an old video, as you can tell, it's black and white. But this cliff face just fell away. It's an erosion event. Something, some force is causing that cliff face to fall apart, just like some force was causing this snow to fall down the mountain. Some force was causing this mud to fall down the mountain. So what are those forces? Well, in Michigan, in most places, you get water. And water, just like the Grand Canyon getting carved, it's very powerful. In fact, water, pretty undefeated against land, if given enough time. So in Michigan, these are all homes on the Great Lakes. And you can see these bluffs that they lived on. You know, this, all this dirt you're seeing at some point before that looked like dirt, that was maybe a hill. And the water just kept continuing to wash upon shore, wash upon shore. And as it did, kind of like that sandpaper in the Grand Canyon, it hit the shore, brought some dirt with it back in the lake. Hit the shore, brought some dirt with it back in the lake. Till eventually, like you see in this bottom right, you see things start to fall apart. And these are pictures you're left with. So how do we stop it? Obviously... You don't want your house to fall into the water. So how do we stop that from happening? Well, they've got these things called seawalls that prevent, you know, it's concrete. Concrete's a little stronger than what the natural dirt may be. So the seawall is going to prevent the water from hitting the grass at all, hitting the dirt at all, and it hits that concrete. That's not the most natural. Some people say it's not pretty. So you may see something like this on the right, like these rocks. The water comes up and it hits the rocks as opposed to just some sand. Another thing we can think about is plants. And plants, they've got these root systems down there in the dirt. And as these roots go through the dirt, those roots kind of hug the dirt like you'd hug a friend or a parent. And it keeps that dirt real tight and real close. So when water comes in, that dirt is so close together and so packed tight that the water can't get in between it to run it, to rub it away, to bring it back in the lake or the river. You may see it if you ever go to the beach, I'm not sure where you are watching this, but if you, I've been out to Lake Michigan quite a bit. If you go to Lake Michigan, you may see some signs that say, please don't step on these dunes. You may see a sign that says stay off beach grass dune restoration is in progress. Now, going back to that dirt example, if you've ever held sand in your fingers, it falls out of your hand really quick, right? It's very loose. It's not packed at all. Even if you put water in it and try to pack it away, it still doesn't pack very tight. If you've ever seen, if you've ever built a sandcastle, if a, if a wave comes and hits it, that sandcastle is probably going bye-bye. So when you get around these dune areas, that's all sand. You don't have anything to hold that sand together if there's no plants on it, which is a recipe for, could be disaster, could be natural erosion. It just depends if you've got a house on a dune or not, I, I suppose. 
but you may see something like this. And what this is trying to do is it's growing dune grass to hug that sand real tight and prevent erosion. And so what we have to consider as humans on earth is that around 70% of the earth is water. And as I said, you get water and you get enough time, that's gonna beat land every single time. So as humans, you know, the Grand Canyon's 5 million years old and you as a human live a hundred years, that's not very long. In, in erosion time, in earth time, right? So given enough time, things are gonna look differently. Now in our lifetime, it's probably gonna have to be one of those fast erosion events for us to notice it because 100 years out of a 5 million year process, that's a blink of an eye, you're not really gonna notice anything. But a landslide, an avalanche, a dune collapse, you could see that, you maybe seen it an example yourself maybe something you saw when you were really young looked different than it does now so if we want to prevent those say you have a nice house somewhere that's getting eroded say you have land that's that's fallen into the lake what can you do well first you have to respect the earth's process you have to realize that most of this erosion is natural it's going to happen whether you're around or not and by respecting the earth, you know, and you recognize that this water is gonna take out this land eventually. So let's do our best to try and stop it. So you can build structures like the sea walls, um, like the, the cobble to prevent erosion. My favorite, my preferred one is keep grasses and trees around. The more roots and vegetation that you have to hold on to things, the less likely something's going to fall into the ocean or into the lake because it has all those roots hugging it. Another thing we can do is build smartly. Probably not the best idea to build a house on something that looks like that. As you can see, there's nothing under it. It's been eroded. The lake or the ocean has taken away so much of that that it's not safe to stand on anymore. So in closing, just remember the few things that you've learned today that I've taught you. And if you take one thing at all from this, just remember time and water undefeated. Can't beat it. It's going to happen. So let's respect it. We can try to prevent it. Let's keep grasses and trees around. And keep these pretty landmarks around. And maybe if you could take a look at the earth in five year, five million years from now, there may be another Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon that we see today may be another mile deeper. Nobody knows. But thank you for coming to my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it's kind of quick. I hope you learned something. That was the goal. Um, and if you have any questions, teachers, students, whatever, you can look me up on the Michigan State website. Taylor Haas is my name. Send me an email with feedback. Um, until next time, and enjoy and stay safe out there. Thanks, guys.